Welcome to Auntie K's, your favorite radical queer indigenous auntie bringing you tarot every day. Hello folks and welcome to Auntie K's Tarot. We're going to talk about the card everybody loves to hate, the pregnant empress. These are my only two examples of a pregnant empress actually. So this is interesting, but we are going to talk about it. We're going to talk about why the empress is pregnant and in how this um how this plays into the politics of the time so first of all you know a lot of folks get tired of seeing um the empress is pregnant and uh and tropes about it but some of this goes back to um really old and ancient ideas of um of the of mother earth um of of an earth-based goddess um you know giving birth to um to the world and all its creatures upon it um and, and so that's part of it and this um the it's important in a lot of ways because you know we're talking about the story of life and um birth it is part of the story of life it it just is it's how all of us came to exist and it can simply be useful in a reading um it can simply be useful because at some point um it that's that's going to be an aspect of a reading if you're not opposed to doing a reading and seeing somebody might be pregnant, um, you know, it, it can be useful in a reading. And most certainly uh, up until currently, it, it's something people definitely wanted to see in their divination. And um, usually, you know, the only cards we see that are pregnant are, um, are the Empress and occasionally the Queen of Swords. Um, in, in Marseille, the Queen of Swords tends to also be pregnant. Our issue with the, um, with, with the pregnancy trope, um, comes out of, um, patriarchy and this expectation, um, that as, um, folks with wombs, we will give birth and, um, it also comes out of, you know, being sick and tired of heteronormativity. And largely these are the reasons why folks complain about and get sick of, um, of you know, the, the trope of pregnancy in um, the Empress card. So I thought it might be useful to unpack this a bit. Um, one of the things we tend to think, be taught, believe, um, today is that, um, heteronormativity and the expectation that a person with a womb, um, is going to give birth and that's what expected of them. We tend to think this is something that's like been in history for so, so, so long and we're only finally overcoming it. That's not actually the case. We are taught to think that um, this is an ancient trope um, that has carried forward so that we think it's a normative expectation. Uh, History is written by the conquerors and um, it is designed to... Um, create in us a understanding of the world we live in today by those who rule it. So if we are going to uncover the expectation that somebody with a womb is to give birth, we also absolutely need to look at um, societal understandings of homosexuality. Um, because we think that this is something that's only been accepted in modern times. 
um, as, as an indigenous person, I'm well aware that um, homosexuality and more than two genders was the worldview of, um, of my people prior to colonization. And um, other world indigenous folks generally hold this um, understanding also. So we tend to think that um, a lot of Western civilizations, um, at, you know, insistence that homosexuality is evil and that folks with wombs must give birth comes from the Bible. It doesn't. It does not. Um, well, it does come from Christianity. <clears throat> it is not based in the Bible. And um, the concept uh, from Christians that this was the case is um, relatively new and relatively tied to uh, colonialism, capitalism, and white supremacy. So let's get into it. All right. So Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jewish scholar in the first century, is the first one to mistakenly decide that sodomy is a sin of homosexuality. Nobody else agrees with him. <laughs> in fact, nobody else really agrees with him for a very long time. Uh, but still, homosexuality is not big on anyone's mind. And if it's not big on anyone's mind, it's allowed, <clears throat> you, you, can be, you can be gay or you can be a lesbian. Which, of course, you can only be if you are not expected to give birth. So these understandings really are tied together. Um, if... If women are allowed to be lesbians, then there is not an expectation that a woman must give birth. So, um, we're going to move forward in history significantly before we come to a decision that um, homosexuality and or being a lesbian um, is not okay and women must give birth. Um, there were... Um, people with wombs, um, often classed as women at the time, <clears throat> um, who were expected to give birth and that was seen as their job. Um, and that was because they were empresses and they needed to give birth to, um, prevent fighting about who the next heir is. Um, and then, you know, we also see through the feudal period an expectation of a an empress or a queen um, and higher ranking, you know, um, royalties, lords, ladies to um, give birth for the sake of, you know, uh, upholding power and, um, and money. But what um, those below that class we're expected to do was different. Um, surely I'm wrong and the church was against homosexuality, you know, much longer than I'm implying. No. In fact, you know, there's priests up into the 13th century writing poems about homosexuality um, within the white Christian faith. <laughs> um, so it's not until the mid 12th century that the church starts equating Philo's misrepresentation of sodomy. Um, but they still don't think he's right that it's homosexuality. They decide it's lust. Um, and, and like I just stated, even priests were writing uh, poetry about homosexuality. So it's, it's excess that they're concerned about, lust, excess, um, too much of any behavior. Um, but they don't think Philo's right that that means homosexuality. Um, a little bit later into the 12th century, in 1179, the Third Lateran Council, um, decides to take a stand 
against homosexuality. It really has a lot more to do with othering. Um, we're talking about crusade times. Um, and most of this focus of othering was on Jews, Muslims, and lepers, um, and somewhat on homosexuality. And this is where it, it then begins to grow, but it's still not hugely popular. Um, there are um, religious scholars saying, yeah, I don't know where you're getting that. Uh, Thomas Aquius is, is one known for denouncing this uh, bizarre and new idea. So when does your Western society decide homosexuality is wrong and all uh, folks with wombs had better be giving birth and creating offspring? Um, this concept comes in to being in the fall of feudalism. Like <clears throat> feudalism took a few hundred years to fall, um, but all these things that would become, you know, modern societies, um, judgmental and bigoted and racist norms, um, slowly start to develop as feudalism falls. Why? Because of who's responsible for the fall of feudalism. Um, so the fall of feudalism is largely uh, credited to um, not just the plague, but um, or or environmental factors. They took apart the human factor, um, the the direct human factor, because plague and environmental destruction through Europe, which caused climate issues, um, w was obviously a human factor. Um, but um, the direct human factor that people looked at and equated <clears throat> was uh, the peasantry. And, you know, the peasantry... No, nobody cared if they were producing airs. They didn't actually necessarily want the peasantry to be creating a lot of airs. They they also, in fact, didn't really care what uh, religion the peasantry was practicing. Um, they weren't making enough money to be giving money to the church, so the church really didn't care. Um, if you wanted alms or something, you had to go to church to get that, but... Usually you stood outside the church. You weren't expected to go into the church. Just stand outside it so the good Christian people coming out could uh, give alms. Um, so the peasantry, and in particular um, those peasantry containing wombs, were um, seen as bringing down feudalism, and, and they played a, a large direct hand in that for sure and they were angry about all kinds of things they were angry about the closing of the commons where they got their traditional medicines and gathered food um and held pagan ceremonies which you know they also did in the fields um as they were working if you know like harvest ones and stuff like that and um, so in, in being blamed um, for falling feudalism. Today, we might want to uh, thank and congratulate them. <clears throat> but, you know, for a long time, they were blamed for it. Um, which the, the church starts um, wanting to punish them for it. And part of that punishment is the creation of the idea of the devil and um and devil worship and witchcraft um not i'm not saying magic didn't exist and the church invented it magic absolutely existed but the church invented this idea that folks practicing it were witches and they were worshiping the devil <clears throat> interestingly witchcraft does not get tied to occultism 
Why does witchcraft not get tied to occultism in the 1400s? Simple. Because um, occultism is something practiced by the upper class who did not bring feudalism down. Um, it, and also, occultism is studied by the church uh, up until this time. So, um, the in this time of punishing those who fall feudalism, they are also trying to build feudalism's replacement, which as we know today is capitalist colonialism. Now, capitalist col capitalism required a number of things. It required slavery. It required um, colonialism. And it required laborers and cheap care. So, women uh, can't be lesbians and men can't be gay because they'd better be getting together and um, not just creating heirs for the upper class, but creating laborers um, out of the lower classes. And so, you know, deciding that you're going to live in the woods with your hot lesbian lover and not be given birth is a problem. What else is happening in the 1400s? Well, white folks have discovered um, the predecessors to tarot and as white folks had been doing for a very long time via the study of occultism or what we call occultism today, you know, they took and twisted and created their own version, um, which we now call tarot. So, it is unsurprising the ideas that uphold uh, capitalism, white supremacy, colonialism, slavery, um, and the production of um, laborers is um, interpreted into tarot, which is why we have a strongly problematic Eurocentric um, view of the world through tarot that is also extremely um, heteronormative. And so that's how these ideas get in. In the very beginning, um, you know, now tarot like sort of develops through the 1400s till we get to a creation that roughly resembles um, what the Marseille would become. Um, but certainly by the time the Marseille comes around, we are full fledged in to all these things. You know, white supremacy is no longer being developed. It is fully fleshed out. Heteronormativity is no longer being developed. It is fully fleshed out. Um, and so what we see today is a growth of that. In, you know, we can do what we want with that. We um, can take the Empress trope back further to a time before the 1400s when many folks um, worshiped uh, an earth mother and a fertility goddess because not because everybody with a womb had to give birth but because that's how each of us um, here today came to be um, and we can also use everything I just talked about um, to unpack these um, unhealthy understandings of of the world via this um, capitalist colonial worldview that we are presented with in tarot. When we know where it comes from, when we know the truths that were hidden behind, behind um, 
today's modern history that tells you everything you need to know. When we get behind that and we see the truth um, that this heteronormativity um, and um, modern concepts of patriarchy um, are, aren't um, human norms, but um, a, a creation of capitalism and white supremacy, um, we can change how we view that. Um, and, and we can see that pregnant empress differently because um, now we have a fuller history to take from that. So if we aren't seeing the empress as, um, you know, the queen and the empress who must give birth to the next heir or the lord and lady or the lady who must give birth to the next heir and every single person with a womb who must give birth to the next batch of laborers, then we can see that pregnant empress when we come across her differently. Um, we can see her as um, uh, our beginnings, um, our own personal creation, both, you know, from um, an earth mother um, all, all the way to, you know, um, our own mother or grandmother, um, and in re-envisioning or decolonizing the Empress, taking the Empress back to a time prior to the early um, scenes that set the stage for capitalist colonialism, um, then we can see the things we're supposed to see in this pregnant empress we can see um creativity creation we can see um the growth and the harvest and and the plant life um and the imaginations of various futures um when we no longer her see when we no longer see her as a command that if you have a womb, this is the expectation that you enter into um, into a heteronormative relationship and get that womb seated and start birthing, um, you know, capitalism's future laborers. We, we can see her as more um, when we undo what was done to her, when we take her back to um, a more ancient figure. And so that, folks, is, um, is what I have to add to the conversation of why do why does the empress always have to be pregnant? Can't we get more creative than that? Um, we can. We can get creative by seeing older understandings of that symbolism. By decolonizing, undoing colonialism's um, viewpoint of the empress. And in doing this, um, I, I think we can also use this to start to undo heteronormativity um, by knowing, by seeing um, that heteronormativity, like white supremacy, is a creation that is roughly 600 years old. It's... It's new. It's modern, like the tarot. Um, like the European tarot. 
And um, we have the power within us to, um, via knowledge and um, truth in history, to seeing um, the potential of um, what, what that card can be and can mean even when we're confronted with, um, even when we're confronted with that pregnant empress. That said, I'm not suggesting everybody start creating decks with pregnant empresses again. It, it's awesome to have some that aren't. Um, but also, hopefully, that helps you see her in a new light when that's how she appears in one of your favorite decks. All right, folks, thanks so much for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. I've recently learned that YouTube considers words such as queer and trans as violent. This is hugely problematic, but just the same. Be careful in your comments. Use asterisks or something to avoid the right-wing politics of YouTube. I'm sorry about that, and I thank you. And um, also check out my website, my Patreon, and my Discord for full access to myself, to the readings that I offer, and um, the things that I'm creating. See you later.